you're here today, I'm so glad you, uh, you made it to Ocean's Church. As you can tell, we are, uh, we're all in. I know sometimes we read the scripture, what's the greatest commandments? To love the Lord your God with uh, some of your heart, some of your strength, some of your mind. It's funny that we know the greatest commandment is all, but when we go to a church that we see people going all in, we're almost freaked out. These people are crazy. I've never seen people jump, shout, lift their hands. Why are these people so fired up? This is, I just want to let you know, this could be what all looks like. I'm all in. Come on, tap your neighbor and say, I'm all in. Being all in is wrong. I don't want to be right. We're going to have a good time today. My name is Mark. If I haven't met you yet, uh, I'll be hanging out afterwards. But I want to let you know that you're in the right place. And we're not here just to do a religious calisthenic. We're actually here because we believe that God is still alive. He still speaks. Contrary to popular maybe opinion, God is not angry at the world. God actually sent his son to actually redeem it. The Bible doesn't say that God so loved the church. It says God so loved the We actually believe that God was on a rescue mission. He sent his son. This book, the Bible, we're going to read it today. We're in a series talking about master dreams. And God has a dream. The Bible is a book with 66 different unique books in it. And uh, we know that it's basically broken down into four, uh, four sections. The beginning of the book is broken into creation. The second part of the book is talking about the chosen people. The third part of the book is talking about the Christ that came in the New Testament, that the Old Testament talked about. And the last little bit of the book talks about the church that Jesus gave his life to give birth to. That is all of the 66 books. But all of it comes down to this idea that the first three chapters of the Bible was God's original intention for mankind, which is God the Father wanted to know his kids. And what Adam and Eve lost in three chapters, it would take 1,186 chapters to redeem. And we know this, that God's, his, his mind hasn't changed. He still wants every one of his kids, 9 billion kids. He wants all of them to know him personally. That sounds audacious. Well, let me ask you this. I don't care if you are the Duggar family or who you are. You got 30 kids. Listen to me. No one that has 30 kids only wants to know 27. I've never met a parent that only wants to know some of his kids. Never once. I don't care how weird the guy is, weird the mom is. Usually, parents want to know their kids. Good parents do. And I want you to know today, maybe you've never had a real relationship with God. Today is the day. I actually believe that next 30 minutes, this could be a defining moment in your life. I'm not here propagating religion. I'm not here peddling some sort of new age belief that we're going to make ourselves better and rescue ourselves. Ladies and gentlemen, if humanity did not need saving, Jesus wouldn't have come. We are fallen and we can't get up. Adam fell. He couldn't get up. So God would send a second Adam. And I want to synthesize this a little bit today, but I believe that God is here today to give dreams. Say it with me, dreams. We've been in a series called uh, Master Dreams. And I actually believe that this is collectively that God is actually, he's looking today to give dreams. He gives dreams to all of his kids. It says every good and every perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of heavenly lights. We have a God that is rich in giving resources. The Bible says when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost that he says your young men will dream dreams, your old men will have visions. Part of the fruit of the Holy Spirit is you begin to dream. And some of you are like, I started coming to this church and God started giving me dreams. Here's what I know about God. God will give you a personal dream that's connected to a corporate dream. I'll explain. If you are a CPA, God has a dream for your firm. But if, that, if you're a CPA, God also has a dream for the church you're a part of. And God has a dream for Ocean's Church that ties into the Big C Church in California. Are you hearing me? And the Church of California ties into the Big C Church of America. And what God does in America affects the Big K Kingdom for the world. And so God is so big that he gives personal dreams that are connected to corporate dreams that impact the Kingdom of God. And this is what's exciting today because if you don't know about God's dream, you will like these butlers and like these bakers, you will live a disappointed life. And I'm going to read today out of Genesis chapter 40 if you have your Bibles. I'm going to read a few verses. If you get bored today, I just want to humbly say you're boring. I'm not a boring preacher. 
And so I'm going to do my best. I'm going to have, have a little bit of energy left. And so I, I gave most of it out last service. So I'm just going to preach until, until I run out of gas. Is that all right? But I, uh, I do feel this deep burden today that most people are mad at God. The Bible says in the message translation that men and women, they ruin their lives by bad decisions, and then they blame God. And I actually think that some of you today are blaming God because you feel like you missed your dream or your appointment with your destiny. And some of you might be in your 50s or your 60s. I got good news today that you're always one prayer away from getting back on track. Yeah. Favorite part about that annoying voice when you uh, click in that MapQuest? Who remembers MapQuest? Rest in peace. Google Maps. It's for the youngsters. Google Maps, when you type in that address and you hit start, what we know is this, is that when you are going the wrong direction, it will continually try to reroute and reroute and reroute. And you can be the most obstinate person in the world and just drive the opposite direction. You'll just keep hearing the voice say, turn here, turn here, turn here. And it's like this endless opportunity of getting back on track. And I want you to know this is the loving mercy of God that you're always just one obedient ear of getting back in the right direction. God told me to do a little drive-by before I got started this morning. I'm from the Antelope Valley. Come on. God likes to speak to me in old ways. But he said this before I got started, that some of you today here would, would, would identify with a hard life. You have a, you've had a hard circumstances growing up that's resulted in living with a hard heart. God told me today that if you would turn to him in this service that he would take out of your heart the heart of stone and he would replace it with a heart of clay. And I was reading through Exodus again this week and one of the things I took, for, took away is that a hard heart is actually people that have seen the power of God that don't want to acknowledge God. That's what happened to Pharaoh. Pharaoh saw God's power, didn't want to give God credit. And some of you today, you've seen enough of God to believe, but you have so much pain in your heart you don't want to believe. And I felt like God said he'll take the pain away if you'll turn to him. Second group, God said there were some of you here today, like Exodus, the darkness in your life is tangible. You've been having dreams, nightmares, panic attacks. And I heard the Lord say that he's only, he doesn't cause that to happen, but he'll allow people to know darkness, to be aware that there is an opposite light that's the antithesis. If there is a darkness in the earth that can be tangibly felt, so is there a light. And those of us Christians in this room can relate that there is a God, that his light is tangible. His love will penetrate your heart, your soul, your spirit. You'll cry, you'll weep, you'll shake, you'll rattle. You Are you hearing me today? There is a light that is real and powerful. And I just felt like before I got started today, I got to tell you that. All right, if you've got your Bible, Genesis chapter 40, let's read this together. I'm going to pass around. Before I get into this today, we've been studying the life of Joseph. Joseph was a master dreamer. He was 17. How old? I need you to help me preach this service. Can you lead in a little bit more today? How old? He was 17 years old when he got a dream. The dream actually upset his brothers, irritate his family, made enemies out of his loved ones. And we know the dream was pretty vast. It was a dream of people bowing to him. It was a dream of being in power in the world. And we know that it would be actually 13 years of hell that his brothers would strip him of his coat. And as I mentioned a couple weeks ago, that they could steal his coat, but they couldn't steal his character. And today, you know, the story of Joseph is that in 13 years, he was given three different coats. The first coat was taken by his brothers. The second coat was taken by Potiphar's wife. And the third coat was put on him by the king of the world. And I actually believe that God can redeem the seasons that you've lost coats. Some of you have lost favor. Some of you lost marriages. Some of you have lost your health. Some of you have lost your family. But I want you to know there is a God in heaven that can redeem what the locust devoured. If you believe it, can I get a good amen? That I feel like preaching up in this place. I hear God today, and I felt God as I was praying for you this week, and I just heard the Lord say, Mark, tell my people that I want them to get ready for their dream appointments. Get my people ready for their dream appointments. I'm going to talk to you about dream appointments today. We know the story goes 13 years into this journey. Basically, let's go back. 10 years into the journey, at the end of serving the general of Egypt, his wife cast longing eyes. We talked about this two weeks ago. 
You go back and catch the podcast. But what we know, this is where some of you were mad at God at today. Joseph does the right thing, denies a secret affair, leaves his clothes in this woman's hands, and innocently runs away, but is falsely accused and convicted of rape. And I don't know, some of you are here today and you're mad at God because you did the right thing and you got locked up in a dungeon. It is possible to actually think that you would get rewarded for doing what's right and end up in a prison where people go that do what's wrong. This, unfortunately, is one of the main reasons why people get disappointed. And when you get disappointed, you miss your appointment. You guys ready to go today? I, this can be kind of like a little stronger. I'm not going to tell as many jokes as I normally do. My wife said I got to tell, tell more jokes this, this service. She likes it when I'm funny. But uh, I'll juggle knives next week, next week. Is that all right? Juggle knives and fire. Is that okay? I just, I feel this burning conviction that there are so many people mad at life, angry at life, because they are missing their God-given dream appointments. So, Genesis chapter 40, we read the story. He gets locked up into a dungeon. A little bit of history here. We know that Potiphar didn't believe his wife. If he did believe his wife, that he came on to his wife, tried to rape her, he would have killed her. That was punishable by death. We know that he was probably going, you know what? I know you're innocent, but i got to keep the face looking good in front of my wife. So I'm going to lock you into a dungeon that I have authority over. I'm going to guess that he probably put a good word in with the jailer. And so the jailer would promote him quickly. And we find him in prison probably 10 years since he got thrown into a pit at the age of 17. Probably about 27 years of age. And at 27, we pick up reading that it came to pass, chapter 40, verse 1, that after these things, the butler and the baker, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt offended the Lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief butler and the chief baker. So he put them in the custody of the captain of the guard in the prison and the place where Joseph was confined. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them, so they were in custody for a while. Then the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, had a dream. Help me, Ocean's Church. Had a what? Dream. Both of them had a dream. Each dream in the same night. Each man's dream with its own interpretation. And Joseph came into them in the morning, and he looked at them, and he saw that they were sad. They were what? And he asked Pharaoh, the officers who were with him in the custody of the Lord's house, saying, Why do you look so sad today? And they said to him, Each, all, both of us, have had a dream, and there is no one here to interpret it. So Joseph responded, and he said, Do not interpretations belong to God. I'll tell you when you're ready to be elevated by God is when you're ready to give him the credit for where solutions come from. I digress just for a moment. We live in a world that's locked up in spiritual dungeons that have everything that know the king, have, have wealthy friends in high places, have had big careers and big houses and married to models, and yet like these butlers and like these bakers, they're empty on the inside because they have God dreams... That they don't know what they mean. Ladies and gentlemen, means can never give you meaning. And we have a world that's gotten wealthy, but they don't know God. And I'll tell you right now that this butler and this baker, these guys were powerful. They were close to the most powerful man in the world. But they were sad in a dungeon because like the rest of the world that doesn't know Jesus, they have dreams that God gave them, gifts that God gave them, but they don't know what they mean. And the only reason why Joseph was able to help their dreams is because he was able to steward his dreams. And I want you to know as Christians that we can't help a lost world that's locked up incarcerated to a godless life, wondering why do I have these desires that I have no satisfaction in. I love the Jesus Revolution, that line when Lonnie Frisbee says, they're looking for Jesus in the drugs. They're looking for Jesus in the sex. They're looking for Jesus, but they're looking in the wrong places. I want you to know today, ladies and gentlemen, that God is found when we search for him with all of our hearts. 
And he goes on the record to say to these guys, look, there is a God that gives interpretation to dreams. So he goes on and he says both the dreams, and he interprets both. To the cupbearer, he says, you'll be reinstated in three days. To the baker, he says, your head is going to be off your shoulders in three days. And we pick up reading. Both things happen just as he said. Verse 21, and, the, and, and, and then Pharaoh restored the chief butler, the chief, the, the, excuse me, the chief cupbearer to his butlership again. To the place that the cup uh, in, in Pharaoh's hand, and he hanged the chief baker. So Joseph had interpreted both of them accurately. Verse 23. Yet the chief butler did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. Verse 1, chapter 41. Then it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream. And behold, he stood by the river. Listen to me. I think the only reason that God waited two more years to give a dream to Pharaoh is because Joseph tried to help himself out. In verse 14 of chapter 40, he says, guys, when this goes well for you, buddy, remember me in front of the king. And I want you to know today that God does not need anyone's help to find you. When you're ready to be used for God's dream... Nobody has to give God your address. You guys ready to go today? I feel like preaching, man. Father, I just thank you for the great opportunity that we have today to get our hearts ready, to get our perspective ready, to be used by you for the dreams that you wired us for, our children for, our grandchildren for. Ultimately, we know, God, we're on this earth maybe 70, 80, 90 years at best, and God, we're here to steward this window of time to make a difference for eternity. God, remind us that our days are limited. Remind us that, Lord, we are like the grass that is here today and gone tomorrow. So, Lord, let us not, Lord, live as though death is not inevitable. Let us live with eternity in mind and with purpose in every stride. Father, speak to us today with anointing that breaks every yoke, every hex, every vex. And I pray in authority from heaven, Lord, to reveal to Orange County there is a God in heaven that can still do the impossible. In Jesus' name, we honor you. And all of God's kids shouted a hearty amen. Amen, amen. I, uh, I was thinking about, I love appointments. I actually enjoy meeting with people. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm a pastor and not a podcaster. I actually enjoy personal interaction. I like getting together with people. I like asking life stories. I've met with a lot of you guys. If I asked right now, if I've had a personal meeting with you, I bet, I bet probably 15% of this church would raise their hands. I've met with a lot of you guys. I know a lot of you by name, and I love meeting with people in our church. But I've got to admit, as a pastor, I'm not perfect. And there's some places I don't like to go. And there's some meetings I don't like to have. And uh, two places I don't enjoy appointments is dentist offices. I can stop there just to talk about that for a little bit. I love my dentist, but I'm like, dude, I can't talk to you right now. You ever try talking when you got like those razor blades in your mouth? It's like, hey, we want to take some x-rays of your teeth, but we need you to, we need you to, Actually, just take a deep bite onto this razor blade, this plastic razor blade. You ever done that before? It's X-rays? You ever taste? They always they always offer you like, do you want your teeth clean with bubble gum? Like that ain't bubble gum. You guys don't know what bubble gum tastes like. They're like, do you want like uh, do you want like uh, like mint? I'm like, that's not mint. It's like sandpaper putting on my teeth, my gums. I don't like going to the dentist because I don't like lying. There's going to be that awkward moment. He looks at me and he goes, how you been flossing? I'm like, when was I here last? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not that bad. I floss, but not as much as they want me to floss. You ever know, like, dentist is like, I, every dentist I've ever had, they're like, oh, we, you know, when you're just home, you're watching TV, just get your toothbrush, just massage your gums. I'm like, look, you might be into some weird stuff. That's not hobby talk for me. I don't like massaging my gums with a soft bristle toothbrush. Not into those appointments. I see the dentist appointment, teeth cleaning every six months, I'll do it. But I'm always like, oh, here it comes. One of my least favorite things, I get to the office, and there's always, like, the paperwork that I filled out last time. Anybody else wonder, like, 
Who's storing this? Was there a fire? I, I was thinking, we need to get automated with this stuff. I was thinking, I could put some phone calls into Chick-fil-A. They could sort out this organizational process. I have filled this clipboard out 77 times. Anyways, appointments. Someone say appointments. I was thinking about this. Doctors and dentists, they let you come into the appointment when they think that you're ready. And here's my thesis for all you TED Talkers today is I want you to write this down. Is I really felt like God was telling me this, that it's tragic when a person succeeds before he is ready. We have a generation that's dying because they're succeeding before they're ready. And I want you to know today that God loves you so much. He wants you to get ready so that when you succeed, you can stay there. We got too many people that rise up like weeds and they don't stay planted like oak trees. Weeds spring up overnight. Oak trees grow over decades. One stays, one goes. And I just was praying this week, and I just got, rem I got reminded of Joseph and, and this idea that God set him up 13 years of what Joseph should have got bitter. He should have been bitter at his brothers. He should have been bitter at, at Potiphar. He should have been bitter at his Potiphar's wife. He should have been bitter at the Egyptians. He should have been bitter at God. He had 13 years of evidence that God forgot about me. But what we know about the story is, is he doesn't, like Job, curse God and die. Nowhere in scripture. The only two times there's any vulnerability in the story of Joseph is in verse 14 when he tries to promote himself. And in chapter 48 when he tells his dad how to bless his grandkids. Outside of that, Joseph is flawless in the record of faith. And I was thinking about this, that he was ready for his appointment. Most people think that, Mark, if God was so good, why do bad things happen to good people? And some of you, you disregard. Many academics, many intellectuals, they go, Mark, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't differentiate between how could a good God allow good people to go through bad things? Number one, if your eight-pound brain could fully comprehend God, he's not big. Because I'd like to inform you the chasm between you and God is actually larger between you and the ants that are on this parking lot. And as though you can't explain your 403B to the ants on this parking lot. Likewise, you cannot let God explain to you some of the things that are beyond your comprehension. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are above. Are you hearing me today? Well, if he's so good, why doesn't he answer all of my prayers? Because if he answered all of your prayers, you'd be sitting in his seat. In some ways, that would make you God if he answered every prayer. That's why our faith is not in what we get. Our faith is in a person. Because many people are bipolar Christians because they only believe when they get God what they ask for. Our faith is not in the outcome of our prayers. Faith believes that God can. Faith believes God will. But faith also goes, even if he doesn't. My faith is not in him delivering me from the furnace. My faith is in the fact that he can. We have many people that refuse to believe God for miracles because he doesn't heal every time. That is stupid. That's like saying because we can't be nice to everybody, well, I'm not going to be nice to anybody. No, I'm going to treat one the way I wish I could treat everybody. I feel like preaching up in here a little bit today. Here's my, here's, I just felt like I want to get into this today. Is uh, I was thinking that, that he goes through this moment of his life where some of you are at today, that he does the right thing, but he ends up in a dungeon. God, how could you allow something bad when I did something good? I feel like I'm being punished for doing the right thing. Have you ever been there before? You ever prayed on church on Sunday, gave a tithe on Sunday, did something kind on Sunday, and you're like, what the heck is going on on Monday? I feel like I'm being punished for doing the right thing. Time, there's times that it looks like there is no reward for serving God. But I want to remind you today, Ocean's Church, as we're in the series on dreams, that big dreams require big character. 
And I know that you're not going to like this because no one likes this. We don't talk a lot about this in the church, but Romans 5, put up on the screen. Romans 5, verse 3 through 5. You guys ready to go? Romans 4 talks about justification. Romans 5 talks about the, the benefits of justification and the basis of justification. But before I bore you with theology, let's look at this. You guys ready? Yes. Chapter 5, verse 3. And not only that, but Paul writes, we glory in our I want you to catch this thing because no one likes to talk about tribulations. I don't like talking about tribulations. I'm a preacher. I'm like, God, you got another subject? But here's what I heard the Lord say. He says, Mark, everybody wants to be ready for their appointment. But you don't get appointment ready until you understand the sequential order of Romans chapter 5. Watch me now. It says this. Watch, watch, watch. Let's learn today. It says this. We glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulations produces. Here is, uh, I got some good news for you and some bad news for you. The good news is, I did your homework for you. The bad news is, there is no way in the Bible to develop perseverance that I have found. Other than tribulation. Unfortunately, it's not a gift that can be imparted through prayer. You don't get perseverance by sending money to the Holy Land. The only way scripturally that we develop the perseverance that we need for our destiny is by going through tribulations. Watch what it goes on to say. So we glory in it. Because perseverance will actually produce. Most people don't get to their God appointment dreams. Because God goes, if I gave this car to you, you would kill yourself and you would kill somebody else. So we live frustrated lives. Because you, you were called to soar with eagles, but you're living with chickens. And you're frustrated because you're like, there's more in me. Why isn't God giving it to me? Imagine Joseph. I'm a good leader. I organized that stupid pit. I organized Potiphar's house. I've organized this prison. Where are you, God? But we know this, that his tribulation led to perseverance. There is a difference between patience, godly patience, and perseverance. You want to know what it is? Patience in the kingdom of God is waiting with contentment. Perseverance is more than waiting with contentment. It's fighting the good fight of faith while you do it. So watch what happens. When you persevere, it develops character. Watch what happens after character. When you get character, you get. You know why people commit suicide? They lose. You know why people give up on marriages? They lose. You know why people go, go, go crazy? They lose. Why they leave California? I'm coming for someone today. You better cancel that flight. God needs his generals here. God needs his fighters here. Well, we don't fight in California. We fight in Tennessee. Let's win here. Can I get an amen? But most people, they leave because they lose. And here's what we know. You guys ready for the big punchline today? Here's the big thing that God told me to give you. After we lose hope, it says this. We know this, that hope does not do you know what disappoint means all you grammatical geniuses know this to dis dis it means to undo do you know what disappoint means it means that you missed your appointment do you know why some of you you have great lives but you're still disappointed on the inside because you can succeed by the world standards and be empty on the inside because you missed God's appointment. You can make a good living but not make a God difference. You can retire at 40, golf every day, and still be disappointed. And I know people that are in India that don't make any money, but they're living with this purpose, this joy, this fire, this, this, this passion because they're living in their appointment. Hear me very clearly, Ocean Church. That God told me, he said, Mark, before... Their God dream appointment, we have to, like Joseph, steward tribulation, understand perseverance, and after we get perseverance, we get character, 
And when we have character, we have hope, and hope does not disappoint. Hope will prevent you from missing your God appointment. And those people that never live in God's dream, it's because you've never acknowledged that God is the one that gets you to your God appointment. You guys ready to go today? So number one, if you're taking notes, I want to talk a little bit about tribulation. You guys ready? It's going to get quiet up in the Presbyterian church just for a second. No one likes tribulation, your pastor included. But here's what I know about tribulation. John 16, says this. In the world, you will have trouble. Tribulation. Jesus, by the way, is the one talking. And before those Debbies and those Karens leave us there, because there's people in the body of Christ that want to leave us in this point of tribulation. Well, guess what, preacher? We're just going to like, look, the world's falling apart. California's going to fall into the ocean. Yes, it is. Ocean's church. Okay. That's what I have to say to you, Karen. But hear me. Is I know this, is that God actually uses tribulation. Watch what he says. He says, in this world there will be tribulation, but be of good courage. For I have overcome the world. And it goes on and says, because as I am, so are, so are you, so are me in this world. So if God says to be of good courage because he overcomes the world, that means we can overcome the world. People have this, this morbid, weird theology that God gets glory, that we have faith that everything's going to fall apart. It requires no faith that things are going to fall apart. It requires faith that when the world is falling apart, the church is rising up. That's what requires faith. There are people that are selling books and selling conferences, telling the world that God doesn't do miracles anymore, God doesn't speak anymore, God doesn't heal anymore, God doesn't do anything great anymore. That all stopped 2,000 years ago. And I'm like, the problem with that is, is it requires no faith. The Bible I read says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. How do you please God with a theology that requires no faith? Can I keep going a little bit today? Here's the issue is John, uh, some of you say, Mark, why do bad things happen to good people? Matthew 7 tells us the riddle. It's a parable of a, of a two-home construction project. One was built on sand. One was built on the rock. Here's what we know. Jesus said, those that hear my words and do them are like a wise man that built his house on the rock. He says, the foolish man didn't hear my words, didn't do my words. Here's what we know that most people miss in the story of Matthew chapter 7 is they miss out that the same storm hit both houses. And I'm going to tell you what most pastors won't tell you is that being a Christian does not mean you don't go through trials. Because remember this, it is trials that gives you perseverance. We're always trying to shield our kids from the pain that we went through growing up. Not realizing it might have been that pain that made you who you are. Maybe that's why you can spoil your kids and ruin your kids because they get the reward of your life without the responsibility of your life. We live in a culture that's, what's, that's trying to reproduce the, uh, the performance of their life without reproducing the preparation of their life. That's why you can try to copy your favorite preacher, but if you don't go through what they went through, I don't copy their, their performance. If you want to be like someone great, you go after their preparation. I don't want to learn how you preach. I want to learn how you prayed. I want to learn how you worshiped. I want to learn how you met God. Because if, if I can prepare like you prepared, then I can produce like you produced. Are you hearing me today? Is this too heavy? I don't know. I just feel this fire that people go mad at God. They go, Mark, well, it's raining. Yeah, we live in a fallen world, Jethro. It's raining. It's raining on the just. It's raining on the unjust. Joseph ran from sin and got thrown into a dungeon. That is unjustice. That is injustice. We have judges in our church that would say that is wrong because it is. And while Joe was suffering unjustly, he continued. You know what he did? Continued doing the next right thing. Because here's what I know about life. God chooses what we go through, but we choose how we go through it. And I can be in a bad circumstance and still do the right thing. This is where the trials come in that give us the character and the perseverance that we need to hang on to the dream and the destiny that God has for our lives. Here's what I know is that tribulation comes from the Latin word tribulum. In Paul's day, 
A tribulum was a heavy piece of timber with spikes in it. It was used for threshing the grain. It actually separated the wheat from the chaff. It sounds like the words of Jesus a little bit. Let me say it another way. Hardships, challenges can push us closer to Jesus and remove the chaff that's inside of all of us. And if you don't think you have any chaff in you, you got some pride right now. Only thing in the Bible that I have found to get rid of this thing called chaff is the word perseverance. Perseverance is what gives us the authority to, over, to get God out of tribulation. There's no other way to it. Here's what I know is everybody wants big fruit. No one wants to be pruned. Who wants 2024 to be the most fruitful year ever? Everyone's like, yeah. please. And then God gets his little pruning clippers out. Yeah, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm just praying, man. Fruit thing. Settle down with those. But one of my favorite scholars says the hands of the master are never closer to us than when he's pruning us. Do you know why worship's so powerful when you're in pain? Because it's that pruning moment that God is closer to you. The Bible says he's close to the brokenhearted. And some of you today, you're being pruned, but I want to encourage you with this, that the hand of God is closest to us while he's cutting off the dead branches. Some of you don't realize it, that if you don't let God cut things back, you might get cut off. Because God won't give you more than you can, can carry. God wants to give you, now I know we argue about this all the time, but I, I'm just trying to say this this way, is God's destiny, his, his big dream for you. It's going to require a character that you don't topple over. Many people, they, they topple over because they don't let God prune them. They want to keep bearing more fruit. They just never want to be pruned. And I'm not, I'm not saying that we got to go to Jesus saying, God, get the scissors out. Like, I'm in the mood. Just do it. This is my, my, my personal belief is that we don't have to look for trials. We don't have to, like, suffer. We don't have to, like, we don't have to put nails on our own hands and try to create some stigmata in our own life and, and try to create some weird religious pain in our side so we can be like Jesus. Trials and tribulations, they have a way of finding us. We don't look for them. But when we find ourselves in those situations, James says, count all the joy. Knowing that it's a testing of our faith that does produce patience. That word patience is perseverance. But let perseverance have its perfect work in you that you may be perfect and that you may be complete. Lacking nothing. I actually believe if you have perseverance, you can lack nothing. Most people don't want perseverance, but you need it. I want you to know that Joseph had that perseverance to wait 13 years. 13 years of no evidence of God in his life. You know what he kept on doing for 13 years, I believe? Rehearsing the promises of God. No, nope, God told me that it's going to work out. No, nope, I lost, look, I might have lost my position, but I didn't lose my favor in the family. You can fire me, but you can't kick me out of God's family. You can kick me out of this church, but you can't kick me out of the family of God. I'm telling you right now that Joseph understood you can, you can lose things in life. But he understood this, that his focus was on God. And perseverance is waiting with earnest faith in God. That is perseverance. Waiting with earnest faith is perseverance. And here's what I know about perseverers. David, he got anointed, and he had to wait 13 years from when Samuel poured oil on his head in front of his brothers until he sat on the throne. 13 years of persevering in caves as a fugitive, dodging javelins and spears. 13 years of persevering. I know that the Apostle Paul, he got anointed as an apostle, and it took 13 years before he went on his first missionary journey. 13 years of persevering. I know that Abraham was given a promise that took 25 years to get birth to. You know what he did? 25 years? Persevere. You know what Moses did for 40 years as he got ready on the backside of a desert? Persevere. And I'm not saying that it has to take decades, but I want to just get it into the soul of our church 
I prayed a prayer when I was 25. I was at a pretty well-known conference in the Northwest. I was with all the famous preachers of my generation. We were all together. God was moving. It was powerful. It was beautiful. And after the service, we went into the hotel that we were all staying at. And in that, in that environment, some of these guys I looked up to that were a little older than me, a little younger than me, some my age, all crazy gifted, many that you would know. And I saw these guys start getting a little bit loose, started ordering drinks, asked if I wanted to drink with them. I'm like, oh, I'm good. I don't, I don't drink anymore. I, that's my old life. And I noticed that in that moment, I'm not saying I'm better than them. I just, I'm, I'm like, this is who I am. And I noticed that when the drinks started rolling in, the language started getting looser, one of the guys started flirting with the waitress that's married. And I realized in that moment I could fit in or I could stand out. And here was my prayer. I said, Lord, if I go along with what everyone's doing, I'll probably rise as these guys rise. But I might also fall if these guys fall. And I prayed a prayer at 25 that I stand next to to this day at 39. And I prayed this prayer. I said, Lord, if it takes me longer to get to your promised land, to keep my character intact, I would rather take the long way and stay than to get rich quick, get famous, get this, get success, get accolades, and fall like everybody else before me. I believe some of you need to make a decision with God today that even if it takes 13 years, takes six months, takes six weeks, takes three days. I don't know how long it is. I know some prayers were quick. Some, some prayers were long. One time Jesus prayed for 40 days and 40 nights. That's a long prayer time. Another time he prayed 12 hours to pick 12 disciples. Before he appointed the 12 apostles, he, 12, he, the Bible says he prayed 12 hours. One hour to choose each apostle. But my favorite prayer in the Bible is the three-word prayer when he looked into a tomb and he said, Lazarus, come forth. I don't know how long it's going to take for you to get ready for your appointment, but my prayer as your pastor would be is that regardless of the length of time, that you would have the humility to say, God, don't give me what you have for me until I'm ready for it. I know it's quiet up in here because no one, no one talks of this anymore, but I'm going to keep preaching anyways. I actually believe that God wants to give you a perseverance that will create character. Someone say character. Character is essential in God's purpose for your life. God's tall dream for you requires deep roots of character. I repeat, God's tall dream requires deep character. We don't talk like this. Seems like nowadays you either hear a bunch of legalism that you got to earn your favor with God or you hear a bunch of lawless, greasy grace that says God loves you with your diapers on as you keep peeing the bed every night the rest of your life. Where is the message of grace and truth that yes, God loves me in my sin, but his truth will lead me out of it. That I don't have to die like I was born that I can grow out of my destructive behavior, that God can lead me to the path of righteousness. Yeah, God will give me proven character. Because here's what I know, God's gifts without God's character destroy us. Premature promotion destroys dreams because of a lack of character. I'm telling you, says that Jesus, even Jesus, learned to go through trials. Though he was the Son of God, he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. Yes, Jesus knew all things. Yes, he was fully God. But it also says in Hebrews that he was fully man. Which means that he had to learn how to persevere as a man through overcoming suffering. And if Jesus had to do it, ladies and gentlemen, so do we. Obedience is a character issue, a character that can be, it can't be learned. It, it, it can be learned, but it cannot be imparted. Here's what I know. Deep character is developed by deep trials. Shallow trials, shallow character. You ever seen a kid that's been given everything? No character. Some of you have been through hell, high water. You're like, man, I respect what I have today. You know why? We go through things. I'm telling you today that Joe had a special gift of leadership. Joseph was strong. He was elevated above everybody that was around him. But here's the problem with gifted people 
if you're too gifted, you'll rely on your gifts, not on your God. And I think God, those last two years, it was that last little bit before the turkey came out of the oven. We could probably eat it right now, but it'd be a little bit better. Kind of like the cookies. We can eat them right now, but they'll be a little bit better if we leave them in a little bit longer. And I think 11 years in, when he interpreted two dreams, and he goes, look, this is what's going to happen. And I want you to know that God wants to use you as you steward your dream to be able to give meaning to a world that has dreams that they don't understand. We are the Josephs of our day. We are those that look at sad people around us and say, you don't have to be sad anymore. God has a plan for your life. God can restore your fortunes. God can bring you out of that despair. God can restore what you lost. Are you hearing me today? Where are the Josephs that say you don't have to die in this dungeon? God can give you favor with the king. I'm convinced that God is raising up Josephs. And here's what I want to show this last couple things in you today. Is write this point down is that God, God wants to give you hope. The truth is Joseph could have become a bitter, church hurt Christian. It was 2023. He'd probably be blogging from his mom's basement, writing negative reviews about all the churches in Orange County. By the way, if you write negative reviews about churches, there's a good chance you aren't going to heaven. Can I tell you the truth? You know why? I don't like when people talk bad about my wife. And God doesn't either. You keep your little negative review to yourself. Oh, I feel like I offended somebody. I like that feeling though. I like telling the truth. We got a general, Mike, Mike Tyson said it best. He says, this social media age has taught people what it forgot. They forgot what it feels like to get punched back in the face. We got a bunch of little basement warriors writing bad, big bad things about people that are doing something for God. I'm tired of people criticizing Joel Osteen. I'm tired of people throwing rocks at leaders in the body of Christ that have had hard times. What have you done for God? All you little basement warriors spent a year online courses. You think you're doing, listen to me, do something for God. People rowing don't have time to criticize the speed of the ship. Sorry, man, I just feel fired up. Bunch of critics. Where are the creators? The way that we criticize the world is by creating something better. Love transforms the world through creating, not through criticizing. And the way that we show the world a better way in the church is by modeling creation, not criticism. Got more, but I'm dating this thing. I'm dating those notes. Y'all dating you. Married to the Holy Spirit. You're here today. I just feel the heart of God for you. You don't want to miss your appointment. You don't want to be disappointed. If you're disappointed today, I got good news for you today. You are one decision away from saying, God, I'm going through trials. I've been through hell and high water. I've been going through some stuff, but I want you to know, God, I still trust you. And I haven't given up that what you said to me will come true. You haven't forgotten about my family. You're not going to let go of my business. You're going to take care of us physically, mentally, financially. God, I believe that what you said is true. And I want you to know, ladies and gentlemen, that we have a generation that wants to sit on thrones that have never killed any giants. I feel like something's going to happen today in your life. And here's what I hear the Lord saying. You want to be ready for your appointment? You say, God, in tribulations, keep my eyes on you. And when I'm going through hard times, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to persevere. I'm telling you right now, I feel like God is getting our church ready. I think, honestly, when I got back from the UK, I had this overwhelming sense that we have no idea how God is going to use this church to actually start things around the earth. There are people that have never experienced an ounce of the glory, the manifest presence of Jesus Christ that are going to experience at Ocean's churches all over the world. But we can't go to the nations if we don't have the character for this neighborhood. But praying this person since I was 25, Lord, if it takes longer, I want to stay. I want to walk with you. 
I want to be your friend. I love this, love this phrase. I'm a friend of God through obedience, but I'm a child of God by faith. Some of you get those things confused. You think that you earn your way into God's love. You don't. You don't deserve his love. He loves you. But you can be in his family but not be his friend. Friendship is reserved with those that obey him even when it's hard. And there'll be hard moments of your life. And I want you to know today, take up good courage. Don't, don't worry. The Bible says that we glory in our tribulations. Knowing that tribulations produce what? Perseverance. Perseverance produces character. Character produces and hope does not disappoint. We're not missing our appointment at Ocean's Church. No, sir. We're going to be like those that have the Holy Spirit poured out in our hearts. Amen? I don't know a lot of things in life. I don't know why, you know, noses run and feet smell. I don't know. I don't know why our federal government owes $22 trillion and has the audacity to give me a credit score. Worry about yourself, baby girl. Come on. I don't know a lot of things. But I do know this. I know that if I can trust God and keep my eyes on him, that Hebrews 6.12 says that it is through faith and it is through perseverance that we inherit the promises of God. I want you to know that God has a dream for your life. It's a promise. And that promise, all of those promises, they are yes and they are amen in Christ Jesus. But we inherit them through faith and through so we're going to be a church that says God will go through the tribulation with perseverance. And with perseverance, we're going to get character. And through character, we're going to have hope. And that hope is going to get us ready for our divine appointments. Amen? Come on, give me a hand clap if you love today. Mighty God. I feel like just honoring God with a little worship. Is that all right? Can I just ask you to love church more than you love sports? Can I ask you if we go overtime once every six weeks, second service, we sing a song at the end, that you would treat it like getting a bonus overtime quarter at the Lakers game. Don't be in a rush to leave the presence of God. This place will change your life. We're going to sing a song, and then we're going to pray. Y'all ready? Who believes that he's got the whole world in his hands? Come on, lift your hands. If you're here today, you want to trust him. You want to trust him. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. In his hands, he's got the whole wide world in his hands. In his hands, he's got the whole wide world in his hands. In his hands, thank you, Lord. He got the whole wide world in his hands. In his hands, he's got the whole.
got the whole wide world in his hands. Yes, you do. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. In his hands. Come on, just the voices. He's here. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. In his hands. Come on, remind yourself. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. In his hands. Come on, he's got your world. Tell him, tell him. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. right now what type of reaffirmation would you say I feel like some of you made a deal with God a long time ago and it's almost like your contract's up and it's time to re-sign like it's a re-signing season for some of you that have been in the faith for years decades it's time to re-enlist for another another segment of action-packed faith God I want to be ready useful for the master for every good work I pray, Lord, today that you would prepare from the oldest to the youngest. God, get us ready for the dream. Get us ready for your appointment. I pray, Lord, it says no man knows the day or the hour that the master will return. But I pray that we'd be like the wise virgins that have oil. That we have, Lord, the anointing. That we're ready to go with our, with our flame lit. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would get us ready for every task, every assignment. I don't know why I have this overwhelming sense today that God is sending, I believe, our church to the nations. I believe that, we, he says in Psalms chapter 2, ask of me and I will give you the nations as your inheritance, the end of the earth as a special possession. And I believe, Lord, that what you're doing in Orange County is not going to stop here. I believe the days will come, Lord, that you will cover the earth with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. I pray, Lord, that you would give us cathedrals. You would give us, Lord, even historical sites. I believe the days will come that in, not only in Europe, but I believe all over, all over South America, all over Africa, all over Asia. I believe, Lord, that what you would do here would go all over the earth. So I pray today. I know that's a big vision for the church, but I know that within that big vision, there is a vision and a dream for each one of these ten. So I'm asking, Lord, today, whether we're watching online or we're in the room, that, God, you would meet us and reignite a fresh, crystal clear picture. God, what do you want me dreaming for? What appointment do you have with my life? 
Next week, I'm going to be talking a lot about even just how we steward power and how we overcome and we lead well when we step into our dreams. And I just pray right now, Spirit of God, that we would be a church that can handle the God-sized dreams that you give us in Jesus' name. You're here today, you feel like this message was for you in some way, to shape, size, or form. Would you give me a wave offering? Just come on, say, God, I'm listening to you today. I'm hearing you today. Grab your neighbor's hand if that's you. I'm going to pray for our neighbors today. Say, Lord. Come on, grab that sweaty hand and say, Lord, I bless my neighbor on both sides. Lord, raise them up with an unshakable perseverance that regardless of challenges or trials, they would trust you. Give them faith to persevere. Give them character. Give them hope. Make them ready for the dream appointment you made them for. I bless them. I encourage them. In Jesus' name, you let go of that hand. Say amen. Can we give the Lord a 10-second hand clap offering today? Thank Him for being a good God that gets us ready for the great things that He made us for. Hey, last thing we'll do. I know we went long today. I apologize. I was gone last week, so I had like two weeks of messages backed up. But here, I'm going to end like this. We do this every week at Ocean's Church. We pray for the sick, and we give an opportunity, an honor ramp for those that aren't living for Jesus to get right. Before you leave, please don't leave until we do this. Just take about two minutes. If you're here today, maybe you were the person at the beginning of the service that you had a hard heart because you've had a hard life. Or maybe you're here and you've been living in that darkness that's tangible. I want you to know today if that's you, or maybe you're here. I, I saw last service, someone has like dark lungs that you smoked a good chunk of your life. I mean, it's called black lung or something like that, but there's some sort of issue in your lungs. God's going to heal you today. I saw someone else in here. You have some sort of issue in the lining of your stomach, some sort of acidic issue in your stomach. God's going to heal you right now. There's someone here that's crazy, but you have like this weird uh, growth right heel of your foot. God's going to heal your foot, I believe, even right now. God can do miracles. God can do signs, wonders. I actually personally believe that miracles are God's amen to his message. So all over the tents today, I'm out of time. If that's you or you have a need for healing today or deliverance today, lift your hand. It doesn't make you weird. It just makes you honest. We all need prayer sometimes. Hands up all over the tents. Oceans, you know the drill. Find someone next to you put, that has their hand up. Go ahead and put your hand on their shoulder right now. We believe in body ministry. So right now, with every hand that's up, I don't care if we prayed last week, two weeks ago, we keep on praying. We knock and keep on knocking. We ask and we keep on asking. We pursue and we keep on pursuing. So with our hands on everyone that's in need, say this prayer. Say, Jesus, we come in today in your name. And we declare by the power of Jesus Christ, we bind sickness, we bind infirmity, and we loose, we release healing, gifts of healing, working of miracles. Do what doctors, do what attorneys, do what humans cannot do. Do it faster, do it better, do it fully. This week, starting now, in Jesus Christ's name. If you receive it, church, come on, shout a good amen. Every week we do that. Every week people get free. Every week people get healed. And if you haven't yet, keep responding until God does it. Last thing we do, get you out of here today in this, this four-hour long service. Last thing we do today is you say, Mark, I came here without living for Jesus. I walked in these tents. I know about God, but I'm not living personally for Him. I'm not asking if you study your Bible. I'm asking, are you living for Jesus? That's you today, all over the tents. There was about 13, I think, last service. There's more in this service. If you want to give your life to Jesus, or rededicate your life to God and say, you know, I've been through some trials, but God is actually using the trials to raise me up for great dreams. If that's you today, all over the room, would you close your eyes? I'll give you three seconds, but I want you to raise your hand and say, Mark, I want to rededicate my life to God today. I don't want to live another day of my life without Jesus. I want to live with Him personally, for Him. You heard me talk today. You're like, can I know God the way that Mark knows God? Yes. God does not love me more than he loves you. He loves all of his kids. 
but it, it starts with you turning to him. Right now, all over the tents, I'm out of time. Would you pop your hand up? You say, Mark, I want to get right with God. I'll give you three seconds. One, thank you, hands going up. Two, God, today is the day of salvation. Real high, keep it up, keep it up. Three, I saw four hands over here. Keep it up, keep it up real high, real high, real high, real high, real high. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Real high, I love it, I love it, I love it. Eleven, anybody else? Twelve, ain't real high? Real high, anybody else? At least twelve. I think, I don't know if I caught, caught thirteen. Awesome. At least 13. If you're watching online right now, I know every week people watch online. You know that every week we have anywhere between 4 and 15 people that will give their lives to Jesus watching online. So if you're watching right now, just write heart, H-E-A-R-T, if you're watching online. If you raised your hand with those 13 or you're online, pray with the rest of us today this prayer of invitation. Say, Jesus. Come on, try it out. Say, Jesus, I acknowledge that you are God. So I turn from my darkness to your light. I call sin, sin, and I turn to you. Forgive me, heal me, redeem me, and fill me with your beautiful Holy Spirit. I want to live the rest of my life with you, for you. Give me a great church, a love for the Bible, and friends that can show me your ways. In Jesus Christ's name, you prayed that prayer. Come on, say a good amen. It's a good day in God's house.